Last, last week we had a look at the fact that God communicates in many, many different ways. Do you remember that? If you weren't here, you can go online, look at it on YouTube. But just like you and I communicate in many different ways, other than just our voice, so God does. But he, he speaks in even more ways than what we do. Who of you sometimes speak love without a word spoken? How do you do that? You learned to last week. Come on. How do you do it? Touch. Your body language. One of the most precious ways of showing someone love is through touch. And God touches us in many ways and wants to touch our hearts. But you've got to allow him to speak in whatever way and be open to receive how he wants to speak to you. But I'm not going to go off track. My title this morning is Don't Stop Hearing from God. Have you stopped hearing the voice of God or closed yourself off to him because of something that's happened in the past? God wants us to hear his voice continually on an ongoing basis, not just a once-off. This morning we're going to have a look at the life of Abraham and uh, how God takes him on a journey of growing him in his faith, where he has to step out on waters that are unknown. And all of us live like that from a day-to-day -day basis, where we have situations in our lives that we do not know what to do. Hence, we need to not stop hearing from God. So would you read with me Genesis 22, verse 1 through to 6. Genesis 20, I hope you can read that. Is it too small? If I was sitting back there, it would be. You need new glasses, okay? <laughs> right, can we, who of you have read this passage before? On the story of Abraham, has it spoken to your heart? Can't remember, okay. Right, here we go. Genesis 22, verse 2 through right to 13. Here we go. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Maria. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Verse 3. Early, early the next morning, Abraham got up and sat on his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offerings and placed it on, Is on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went to on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on, on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld 
from me, your own son, your only son. Verse 13, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Wow. Amazing passage of scripture, hey? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to us through this passage and touch our hearts and that we would be receptive to hear what you are saying to us as your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My first point this morning is obey God no matter what. Are you willing to obey God no matter what he says to you? Are you? Depends on what he says. Here we read it. Let's read it again to refresh our memories. Then God said, take your son, your only son that you have, the only son you have, Isaac, whom you love, you adore the yes, only son of yours, and go to the region, go somewhere there in Maria. Don't worry, when you get out, I'll, I'll direct you. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early, early the next morning, Abraham doesn't question. He says, yes, sir. Okay. Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Now, Abraham was known as a friend of God, right? Have you read that before? He's a friend of God, and God says to him, I want to take your son, your one and only son, and I want him, you to take him to a mountain up there. I'll tell you more or less where it is. Don't worry. Go. And what does Abraham do? Does he question God? Does he argue with God? Doesn't, does he get into a negotiation with God, or does he say, yes, sir? Yes, my God. When God speaks, do you say, yes, my God? Or do you get into a negotiation with him? Yes, but, yes, God. And many of us, I think most of us, think that, you know, we can negotiate with God. And yes, you can. Actually, you can. It's a, no, normally a futile exercise, but you're welcome to do it. Many of us live in futility because we do things that are just a waste of time. And trying to negotiate when God has spoken is a waste of time. Because he calls us to live by faith and not by our emotions. Not by what we see. Are you willing to obey God no matter what he says to you? That is the question. God says to him, I want you to take your son, your one and only son, whom you waited for for 100 years. Now imagine you have to go back home and say, um, my darling, God has told me to take our one and only son. The son that you prayed for for 90 years, well, maybe a little bit less than that, but it took 90 years in coming. Where you were on your knees till they became wrinkled, God told me I must go and sacrifice our one and only son. What do you think your wife's going to say to you? Hey? <laughs> It, for me, it would be a suicide mission, that is true. So, in other words, should you tell her? Ah. Sometimes you don't tell people certain things because God instructed you, not them. And I'll deal with that just now. But you need to be willing to obey God irrespective of the cost. Are you willing to obey God no matter what he says to you? 
And it's very f- funny also, sometimes God, go, here you, he says to him, go to the region of, uh, of Maria. Now the, those mountains are quite big. They are quite big. And he says there, uh, the mountain I will tell you about, there, just go. He doesn't tell them the exact place. And so often in life we want to know the exact step by step. This is going to happen, then that, then that. And God doesn't work like that. Have you found that God is sometimes very vague? I want you to do this. Okay, and then after that, and he's silent. And you say, uh, did you say something? And he's silent. Because he wants you to exercise your and to step out even where you are fearful. He wants us to learn to live by faith and not by sight. And yet we don't want that. We want to, we want, you must do this and then this and then this and that. We want like a recipe. Who of you love recipes? You're in trouble in this <laughs> regard. My mother's in serious trouble. She likes it like that. God's not like that. He will tell you, I want to do this, and we want, and then after that, well, how, uh, and it's just, and he's silent. He's spoken. And sometimes we need to go and take that step of faith, and when we get there, we will know that we know this is where I'm to be. We, 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 we step out in faith that we know that we know that this is the woman that I'm to marry. I don't know, but when I get there, I will know. That is obeying God no matter what the cost. God will tell you while you walk, and if you don't walk, he will not talk. It's in our walking, it's in our step, it's in our walking in faith that when we take that next step, he will sometimes say, yes. Or we'll have this unction that we know that we know this is where I need to be. Or we know that we know this is where I need to sacrifice my son. Yet we want the exact pinpoint location. And he doesn't always work like that. Go there. When you Get close, I'll direct you. That is what he's saying to us. I will direct you. But just be continuously open. I believe that these kind of situations that sometimes God takes us through these trials, if you want to call it tribulation, these hard instructions, are like the gymnasium for our for us to learn to hear his voice better, to exercise our spiritual ears, to hear what he is saying, and to be led by his spirit, and not our emotions and our feelings. So may we learn to obey God no matter what he says. Number two, let go of others' opinions. Mmm, there's a tough one for some of us. This is a tough one for many of us. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. I believe that sometimes we need to be willing to separate ourselves from others so that God can take us to where he wants us to be. Sometimes God does not want others to take the journey with us. The question is, are you willing to let go of those that have not been called to take that journey with you, even though they helped you tremendously? They supported you. They carried the wood for you. They carried you through tough times, through financial situation. They bailed you out. They paid your rent, whatever the case. There are sometimes times where you have to cut that tie and you need to let go and say, these people are not called to come with me any further. Are you willing to do that, though? 
And there are times where God says you need to let go. These people are not intended to go with you on this journey because they'll hamper you and prevent you from walking into the calling that God has for you. And sometimes it's very hard to say, well, this far no further. I will no longer allow you to have influence in my life in this regard. I will no longer allow your opinion of saying, don't dare, don't go, don't go. Don't do this. No, but what if this and maybe that and how come this? And Maybe God's saying to you it is time to let go of this person in your life so that you can go into the calling that God has for you. Let me tell you, the higher and closer you get to his calling, the less people will be around you, I guarantee you. There are some people that will stop you from walking the road that God has called you but it is your choice to allow them to or not. May you not allow them to stop you. So let go of some of those opinions and those naysayers and those people that are holding you back from obeying God in everything. Number three, Jesus was willing to be slain. Wow. Wow. Verse 6 through to 7, it says, There Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Who did he place it on? Who did he place the wood on? Oh, do you see any shadow in this? Hello? Okay, there are a lot of shadows and weird types and similes that we'll get in this passage, but I, we cannot deal with all of them. It's just not the time. But I will deal with a couple. Here you can see one. And he places on, on his son Isaac. Please note, his son Isaac, if he could carry all the wood for the burnt offering, was not a little picking in. Hello? He was his child, but he was no baby. Mm. Okay. Interesting, just like Jesus carried the cross. And he himself carried the fire and the, uh, and the knife. That's Abraham. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham re replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How would you have felt if you were Isaac? He's done this before. He knows what takes place. He's seen the gruesomeness of it. And he says, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Jesus said to the Father, Father, if there's possibly just any other way, Yet not my will, but thy will be done. Here, Isaac goes, and he doesn't fight. <coughs> Did you notice that? He did not fight against Abraham, yet he could have. He was big enough to. I can guarantee you Abraham would not have tied him down if he did not willingly lay his life down. And this is something for us to comprehend that he would be willing to lay his, down li his, li lay his life down as a sacrifice. Just like Jesus, who in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God, yet he lay his life down for us. Wow. And this is just a shadow. That's all it is. Nothing more, actually. A tremendous lesson that Abraham was going through, but he was going through it for you and I. And for himself, but mainly for us. How 
Hallelujah for the confirmation that we have in the shadow of Isaac. Being willing to submit himself to death, even death, of a sacrificial fast that was unfair, unwilling, and unnecessary for him to pay. The only problem is that Isaac's blood was impure, and God knew it. <coughs> and there was only one person's blood that was pure enough to take away the sins of the world, and that is Jesus Christ. Not Isaac. God didn't want Isaac's blood because it was impure. Jesus was willing to be slain because he saw that he would purchase our blood, purchase our lives through his blood, sorry. Praise God for that. Number four, trust God no matter the situation. We read in verse 8 through to 10, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the, uh, the place God told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Would you trust God in that situation Would you? Who of you would even have tied your son down? Who of you would manage to get to that point of obedience? Eh? Do you know why? Because we do not know the heart of God. Did he want his son? Hello? Oh, come on, man. Did he want his son? No, he didn't. What, what, what did he want? He wanted his obedience. He wanted his heart. Obedience is better than? Hello. Obedience is better than sacrifice. He wants our heart. He wants us to obey, obey him implicitly, irrespective of the cost. But certainly he didn't want his son. His son was not good enough. That's why he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, for us. But will you obey him even when you don't understand or you can't even comprehend this doesn't make sense according to the character and the nature of God? Will you still obey him? Will you? Why are you allowing this in my life? How come this is so unfair? This is treacherous. This is wrong. Why are you allowing this? <sighs> Maybe he's allowing it because he's wanting to do things in your heart that are not yet in alignment with his heart. He takes us through, through situations and circumstances and allows things and instructs us to do certain things so that our hearts may be tested. God's heart, God, we are, he already knows his heart and where he's at. You and I don't know where we are. We think we do. Till the tough come, time comes and the, and the trial comes like this where he says, okay, you, you say you love me with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your strength. You give up everything. You love me even in comparison. It should be like you hate your children. You say that. Okay, let's test this. Go and sacrifice your son. And then we immediately say, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you see? God allows these things so that he can show us where our hearts are really at. And that we can repent and say, Wow. Only you know the heart of man, O oh God. I thought I knew my heart, but I don't. Would you come and change my heart so that I can have a heart just like yours? I thought it was. And I thought I was totally in love with you. Yet actually I'm putting my children above you. Hello? Who of you are putting your children above God? Will you trust God no matter the situation? Even if it's on 99.99999 that he comes through for you, will you trust him? Or will your faith be so shaken that it's shattered into teeny-weeny pieces? 
that it takes you decades to get back on your feet in stability with Him. I've seen many a Christian where that has taken place. We are called to live by faith and not by sight. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Do you think he had his son there and did not hope that God would make another way? Did you? Of course he did. He hoped he was God's friend and he was hoping that God would somehow, supernaturally, doesn't know how, but that he would provide a lamb. He was hoping for that, but he was sure that no matter what, even at 99.9, that God would come through because he's faithful and he's my friend and my God is able. And we think, and you know, his knife's there, so his faith is gone. No, no, no. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain, even in the face of loss, even in the face of of 99.9 this thing taking place he will come through for me are you willing to trust God to the point of almost or do you give up at the last point you see the issue is not what you're going through but rather what you're learning what you're learning and how your heart has been changed and our behavior, what is taking place in our hearts and the behavior and the choices we make in the situation that we find ourselves in. So when you question God, but why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? Well, maybe he's trying to change our hearts. Maybe he's trying to deal with things that are undealt with yet and where he does not really have full supremacy in our lives. We think he does, yet he does not quite yet in that area. So may we learn to trust God no matter the situation in our lives. Number five, listen to God each step of the journey. Will you learn Lord, will you please teach us to be sensitive to your leading and your prompting every second of every day we pray in Jesus' name. Verse 11 through to 12 says, But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, Do not do anything to him. Now I know. Now I really know what's in your heart. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your only son. And now I know that you will obey me at any cost. And your obedience shows me that you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Because I actually didn't want your sacrifice. I wanted your obedience. Because when I have your obedience, I have your heart. Wow. And here, this is what is taking place here. The test you're going through is not the issue. But this is what God is using for us to better know his voice. He's using it so that we'll learn to hear his voice. Here, God had said, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him. And had God spoken to him and told him to do that? Right? Yes. God told him to do that. And many times we work and live on past revelation and instruction from God, but we don't re-inquire of Him. Mm. Sometimes God tells us to do a thing, and at 99, if you hear His voice, 
and listen for his voice, he'll say, uh, uh, I don't want you to do this anymore. And this is exactly what happened here. You see, I think sometimes we become insensitive to leading and prompting and we shipwreck our lives because we've not remained sensitive to his leading and his calling. Don't kill your dreams because you have be become deaf to the voice of God. Here he says, I want you to sacrifice your son. If he had, if he had been deaf, and he had not had an uncircumcised, if his ear was not circumcised, he would not have heard the voice of God. Sometimes we need to say, Lord, circumcise my spiritual ear that I may hear what you are saying. Because sometimes I don't hear. And I boxed up. And I do box up. And I shipwreck the destiny that you have for me. Some of you say, but does God change his mind? Does he? Mm. Does God change his mind? No. <laughs> does God change his mind? Yes. No. Yes. Which one is it? Did God change his mind in this instance? Did God instruct Abraham to go and sacrifice his son. Yes or no? Yes. Right. Did he hear say, don't do it? Yes or no? Did he change his mind? Yes, he did. Right, there we've got it. So does he change his mind? Yes. No. <laughs> because we know before. Let's read the scriptures because the scriptures tell us the answer. Does he change his mind? Yes, he does. Here it says he changed his mind. Because here he says you're to sacrifice son. At 99 he changed and said, ah, don't want you to do that. Does God change his mind? Would you read with me in Jeremiah 26, 3 to, 3 to 6. Remember that always we need to read scripture and if we don't understand anything, go look somewhere else to get confirmation that we believe correctly, okay? So hold hand, keep your safety belt on, it'll get clarified, okay? Perhaps... They will, this is God, okay? Perhaps they will listen and each will turn from his evil way. Then I will relent on condition that they change their way, right? Okay? Then I will relent and not bring on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. In other words, I'm going to bring disaster upon them because of their behavior. However, if they change, who changes? If they change, I will not bring disaster upon them. So does he change his mind? Yes, he does. Verse 4. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my laws, which I, will, which I have said before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then, and so it's happened again and again, God's mercy and his grace is incredible and he's long-suffering, but there comes the deadline where he says, here no more, okay? And he's getting close to this and he says, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city an object of cursing among all the nations of the earth. You see, when a man changes his conduct, his behavior, God, will change his mind. Then we read in, in Malachi 3 verse 6, let me just throw a spanner and then we clarify this so that you can release yourself from the safety belt. Okay? I, the Lord, do not change. Uh-oh. He never changes because his love and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness never changes. His character never changes. However, can he change his mind when our behavior comes into right alignment with his choice? Yes, of course. That doesn't mean that he changes. His judgment and his discipline will change. 
because our behavior has changed. Our conduct has changed. Our choices have changed. Just like when you say, my darling son, if you do this, I'm going to give you a hiding. In this world, you cannot even say it, but I say it, and I do do it. Hello, YouTube. I give my kid a jolly good hiding if they disobey me, because I love them. They're not illegitimate children. And if you do not do that, you're a useless father. Please get, keep that on YouTube. If you do not discipline your child, and you want to do these clever little tricks that this world is telling you, you're a disobedient servant in the house of God. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I'm so tired of people saying, be careful of what you say. I am going to say what the word of God says, and I'm going to live according to the way God says it, because his way works every time. My parents did it, and all three of their children love and adore God. And I pray the same it will be the case with my four sons. Do not withhold discipline from your children. Sorry, I went totally off track, but that's something that drives me insane. We, we say we love God, but we're willing to obey him in certain respects. But if the world says don't obey him, then we say, yabas. Uh-uh. Don't you dare do that, okay? Let's get back to this. So God can, can God change his mind? Yes. Does he change who he is? No. He stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. Does he love us with an undying love? Yes. Will that ever change? No. Is that sure and I mean? Yes. Can I be, be settled in that belief and knowing that? Yes. However, if he says to you, my darling son, if you do this, I'm going to do this and this to you. You've done this, and so I'm going to give you the hiding of your life. And then you come and you say, forgive me, I'm wrong. Okay. And he says, okay, I choose to withhold the discipline that actually you should be getting. And that is he's right as a parent, right? Hello? Can he change his mind? Yes, he can. Does he change who he is? No. He will never change who he is. There's many examples. Yes. And God changed his mind when he said. Yes. And, he, and that is the thing. When we come in repentance to God, when we say, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned, the just penalty of eternal damnation is removed from us through this sacrifice, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And his judgment is removed. Praise God for that. Acts 7 verse 51 says, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. May we not be like that. May we not resist the Holy Spirit. May we say, Lord... I pray that you would come and circumcise my ears and my heart this day, that I would hear what you are saying every step of the day, every moment of every moment. Because even if you speak in 99 and things change, I will obey. Because if we do not, we might end up sacrificing our destiny. If he had killed his son, he would have changed the whole course of history. And you can, I, have, I would say to God, God, even if it means you have to scream, yeah, yeah, just like he did with Abraham, 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 don't do it. It's not what I want. All I wanted was your heart. And now I know I have it. Now I know that you fear me and you're not willing to withhold your one and only son. Wow. I love you, my son. May we be like that. That we will say, Lord, even though sometimes it seems my ears are, and they're not, they are still, they are not uncircumcised, and that I so often don't hear, would you forgive me for that? And even if it means you audibly shout, please do that. Have mercy on me that you will even shout my name and redirect my paths and my steps that I may live the way you would have me live. God knows the heart of all of us, right? Amen? 
Is that true? How is your heart, how is your heart really revealed? In your choices, in your, in, when you go through the tests. If you don't go through the test, you'll never know. Why do you, I, I, I study and I, I know this work verbatim, I can say this, or I know this scripture, or I know this, this is how to do these sums. Why do I have to go through the test? To make sure that actually, yes, okay, I see, now I do know. That's why he allows us to go through these things. God knows, but he wants us also to know where our hearts are. And there are some that we will pass with flying colors. There are others that we will fail miserably. Why? Because we're not God. And that's why he will take you through tests, not just today, not just tomorrow, not just the next day, but the rest of your days. Because he wants to reveal where our hearts are at and how much we desperately need him. How will your faith ever, ever be strengthened unless you go through a situation like this? If you don't ever go through tough times, how do you ever have to trust him and take a step of faith? Well, God, I, I, I believe you're saying I must do this, but there's nothing in my account. What the heck? No, but you just take the step of faith. Ask my wife, I do that all the time. Drives her insane. But that I'd carry on and I just, and sometimes it is so frustrating because you think, but why? I don't want to live like this anymore. Can't it be this like a massive buffer? And no, God doesn't, maybe he doesn't want that. Let's learn to listen to God each step of the journey. And yes, certainly he wants to strengthen your faith through it. Number six, God will provide even at 99. Verse 13, Abraham looked up, and there in the thickets he saw a ram caught by his, its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Can you just imagine? Um, I immediately want to get emotional when I think just how amazing God is. Hey? I mean, you don't find rams at that height. But here, Abraham is coming up this side, and the provisioners of God is coming up that side, and Abraham is no clue. And we are living life, and we're thinking, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And God here, on the other side, he's bringing that provision, or he's bringing the answer, or he's changing the situation on your behalf. And we think, but Lord, uh, when we take that step of faith, and continue to take that step of faith, even in the unknown. And we take that step on the waters where we uh, 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 just take the step of faith, knowing that he will undergird you, that he will carry you through those times. And we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, yet God does. And here he's making a way on the back of the mountain when we see nothing. There's no light at the end of the tunnel in our lives or in this situation that you find yourself in. Yet he is supernaturally going to make a way because he's God. But you have to say, I will trust you implicitly. Even though we naturally, this ain't going to change. I cannot see this happening in the natural. And boom, suddenly, Abraham, Abraham, and he looks up and there in the thickets, sees a ram. Because he was willing to live by faith and not by sight. He was willing not to live by emotions or the opinions of others. He was willing to let that go and say, whatever you say, God, I will obey. Will you obey God no matter the cost? No matter what anyone else says? No matter how difficult it is? Even if it costs you all you have? Are you willing to say, yes, Lord? We have an amazing God that wants to speak to us. But we need to say, Lord, open my ears. Circumcise them this day, I pray, in your precious name, 
circumcise my heart, that I have to go through far less trials and tribulations for my heart really to be revealed to not just myself, to others, but most important of all to you. Would you strengthen my faith through the faith of others? Even though I know you're going to take me through different steps of faith that I have to step out on. Come, let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your loving kindness. Thank you that you're a just, fair, kind, loving, compassionate God that we can love and that we can serve, and that's never going to change who you are. But thank you that your judgment can change. Your discipline in our lives can change the minute we come before you in repentance. When our behavior and our choices change, you can change the circumstance. You can change your mind of the discipline that will come our way. And so I pray that you would deal mercifully and kindly with us, Lord. I pray that we would not continuously walk on past revelation. God said this, so we carry on, and even though he's wanting to change situations, we remain deaf to that. I pray that will change. <laughs> that we would listen to your voice. Holy Spirit, that you would speak profoundly and that you would be the dominating voice in our lives. Above our spouse, above our children, above our friends, our colleagues. And Lord, if there are some people in our lives that we need to let go of for you to take us, into the greater calling in our lives to which you have called us heavenward. We pray that you would give us the strength and the ability to say from here on and no further, you do not come with me any further on this journey of life. And Lord, I pray that you would grow us. I pray that you would mature us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak clearly into our lives. Even though it might not be as often as we would want, even though we do not have the whole map plotted out, that at the key times in our lives that you would speak and that we would know that we know that you have spoken. I pray that you would supernaturally provide for every person in this congregation with regard to their finances. I pray that you would provide for, for supernaturally for any ailment, any sickness, any disease that they may have in their bodies, that you would make a way, that you would touch them right now, we pray in your precious name. I pray those that are needing a job, that you would supernaturally open that door. Whatever it is that the people in this congregation are crying out to you for, I thank you that you are a God that is faithful to those that remain faithful. And we choose to live by faith and not by sight. We choose to live by faith and not the opinion of others. If you have said it, we'll obey it because we love you and our hearts are for you and you alone. We love you, Jesus. We commit it to you not just for today but for all of our days. Walk with us, we pray, on this journey of life and help us to make the right decisions because we've heard from you, we pray in your precious, precious name. Amen and amen.